My next guest on the 1% Project is the managing partner of GSV Ventures and the co-founder of ASU Summit, the incredible Deborah Quazzo. Coursera, Course Hero, Guild Education are among a few edtech unicorn outliers that GSV has invested in over the years. Bill Gates, Barack Obama, George Bush are among the few superstars who she has hosted over the 11 years of the ASU Summit. In this conversation, she talks about the importance of digitizing education and its impact, how to identify ideas and founders, and why Asian edtech businesses are ready to disrupt the industry and scale globally. Welcome, Deborah, to the 1% Project. Thank you, Patricia. I'm very uh, honored to be here. Thanks for, for inviting me. You have had an excellent career in finance and banking before you stepped into building Think Equity and then venture capital. Why did you make that transition? I started out of college and business school working at large financial institutions, JP Morgan and Merrill Lynch. And, and I was fortunate to, I was at Merrill Lynch for 13 years to in the back, in the, in the end of my you know, last couple of years of my career there to have begun to have recruited over a partner. I was the head of, ultimately the head of growth research, growth banking at Merrill Lynch. And I recruited over a partner of mine, Michael Moe, who's based in Silicon Valley. I was based in Chicago to be the head of growth research. And I think, you know, through some conversations, I realized at that point that, that perhaps a large, you know, prominent or, organization, which had been great to me and had been very successful, was that perhaps I was better fitted to try something entrepreneurial. So Michael and I decided to leave in 2001 and and to actually build our own business, which was Think Equity Partners. So I my, my, my father was an entrepreneur, my grand, I had grandparents who were entrepreneurs, and I had a lot of it. I'd certainly grown up with a lot of it and entrepreneurial spirit. And so the idea of jumping out from a more traditional setting, like a like a big investment bank like Merrill Lynch was at the time, it's now kind of disappeared into Bank America, but it was very enticing. So I really went from there to start Think Equity, the investment bank. We sold that in 2007, happily before the uh, financial crash in 2008, and really started you know, after after staying through our lockup period, left to start what became what we run what we run today, which is GSV, which stands for Global Silicon Valley. So it was all, it was sort of an instinct that I, I, I needed the courage. I think Michael gave me the courage to, to, to sort of vent my entrepreneurial instincts. And, and, and that turned out to be a pretty good, a pretty good uh, decision to, to have been made. Brilliant. And why education? Yeah, it was interesting. Michael Moe had begun to write about, he was a growth strategist. So he had begun to write in the mid 1990s about the sector as being a huge opportunity for entrepreneurs and for technology, the application of technology. And the, and the fundamentals for that were, it was a massive chunk of GDP, global GDP, still is, incredibly dysfunctional, still is to some degree, very fragmented and very, at the time, this was you know, the mid 1990s, at the time, very little application of technology, which was really the only way to scale solutions in a way that would would address the, the sort of gaping holes of educational and skills deficits amongst populations. And, you know, he, he sort of he sketched that out as being a prototypical description of a category that should attract great entrepreneurs. And I think he was a little bit early in forecasting that in the mid 1990s, but sure enough, but we, you know, we became very involved as bankers and, and advisors and research analysts and conveners and ultimately in, in building our funds, but it, it, and it really took until 2010 is when things began to really hit. And we began to see all those kind of component parts put together of great management teams from you know, many coming out of great experiences in other technology areas, many coming out of experiences like Teach for America, where they'd seen mm. very smart young people, where they'd seen inequity on the ground and wanting to create a company that would help drive change. And so if you look at the class of highly scaled ed tech company, the first class I'd call the first cohort, you know, whether it's Coursera or Duolingo or Class Dojo or edX on the not-for-profit side or others, interestingly, they all were kind of formed around that period. But, but for me, it was a matter of 
I, I got very hooked on the idea of working in a sector that I could actually run parallel lives with. I could actually do it 100% in my professional life and I could actually do it 100% or nearly 100% in my personal life. Education is a great sector because we've all, we all had one. So we all have opinions on them and how they could be better. And then, then I had, you know, three kids and, and developed further opinions about that. But it, I got very impassioned about wanting to kind of get up every morning and work with entrepreneurs originally as an advisor, an investment banker, entrepreneurs who were trying to change the world through the, the scale deployment of education technology. And, and then that ultimately ended up in, ended up as in our creating the ASU GSP summit, which is a really important global event for, for education innovators all over the world. And then the summit actually spawned our starting GSP ventures, which is our venture fund, which we're just finishing this, raising the second fund. So it was, it was, it was a circuitous route. It wasn't linear, but it was, uh, it was a very natural, it was an organic route is what I would say. You sort of, which I think it would, would tell people to, when you, when you have a sense that you're, you're developing a passion, you should follow it. Absolutely. And I don't think any route is linear. So congratulations on actually having such an excellent portfolio of startups and businesses who have scaled across the world, right? And you just took a few few of those names. When you see these businesses, how do you know these ideas and teams are unstoppable? Yeah, it's a, it's a question we get up and ask ourselves every single day, because obviously we have made mistakes and we will I promise we will keep making mistakes, but we've been fortunate enough to make some pretty good some pretty good decisions. We have a, you know, we have a framework that we've developed over really t- Michael Mo and I worked together for 23, 24 years. And it was a framework that, that he did, he designed and we, it's pretty simple, but it actually works pretty well. And it's called, we call it the, the five P's. So the first P is people. There's no shortage of great ideas, but it takes a great team, a great team with incredibly high energy level and high vision and high sort of band, you know, bandwidth and clock speed. And so we look for that first and, and then product, obviously the good news is in education, because we've been working in the sector for over 20 years, I think we've got a pretty, pretty high sense of pattern recognition. So, you know, so if you look at our, our funds, we haven't had a lot of, a lot of losses because I think we've been pretty good at avoiding the, the, you know, some mistakes as I said, we've made mistakes and we'll continue to make mistakes, but, but I think our pattern recognition has been quite reliable, quite reliable in the scheme of things. And then we, we have people product product has to be, has to be highly differentiated. We can see, you know, we get, you know, we have a good sense when, when someone's creating something new and that with, with high potential scale, we're very biased to platform companies and, and scaled businesses. Predictability is, is another one that doesn't happen in the early stages, obviously, but we, we begin to look at milestones and are the, you know, our management teams, you know, hitting milestones, are they pivoting when they when they're when things are not working, that's another you know sort of aspect of predictability actually perversely, and then potentials, which is you know addressable market, and and then we we have a fifth P purpose, and while we're not an impact fund as you know is, is specifically defined, you know we believe that every investment we do, if it doesn't have impact, it will not have financial returns, and we believe that companies that operate with purpose are companies that are going to have higher outcomes, both for, you know, financially, as well as professionally for all the individuals involved in the business. So we're very, we're very sensitive to that. I think, in, you know, there is certainly in the education sector, there, there are plenty of ways to, 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 you know, top tick the upper echelon, you know, upper, upper echelon of income that won't lead to high scale, but it might lead to, you know, great profitability, but that's not, that's not where we invest. So that's the framework of how we look at things. And I think, you know, we have a great four person investment committee and we have very robust conversations and, and we, at the end of the day, know that, that, the, that, you know, sort of at least 50% of the formula is going to be based on the strength of the team that we're backing. And so we really also put a heavy shoulder to the teams that we're backing and, and do everything in our human power to, to make sure that we're supporting them appropriately. So, yeah, I think that's, that's how we think about it. And, you know, as I said, fortunately, we've been lucky to be, be fairly right in, 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 in picking, you know, a good number. We've, we've done about half. We've been involved. The, our combined team has been involved in about half of the U.S. unicorns. And we've only gone international on our second fund. So we've, we were pretty domestic on our first, really almost 100% on our first fund. And second fund, 
We've been spending huge amounts of time in India. We're, we'll make our first investment there shortly. We, we're making, we're finishing our first investment in Indonesia. We've made a small investment in Jordan and we've made it with a great team. And we've made an investment in South Africa in Cape Town, an online high school with a, an, again, another fantastic team and, and a company and PhotoMath, a company that's you know, fairly well known in EdTech in Zagreb, Croatia, again, another extraordinary team. So we're, we're, we are, we've gone far, far more international, which we're, we're thrilled about in the second fund. I have so many questions, but I'd probably structure them one by one. First thing, why Asia is so important now? And I would really yeah. like to know Jordan. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, I'll start with Asia. So if you think about, so ed tech fund, uh, venture and growth financing and education technology this year will blow the doors off any previous record. So it'll probably end somewhere around 11 to 12 billion. If you look at it, about half will be China. And then, you know, right now, it, when it was 10 billion, it was basically 5 billion in China, 2 billion in India, 2 billion in the US, and then 1 billion rest of the world. So India is coming along very rapidly, has all the, you know, rising middle class in critical importance of education. It is sadly, culturally way ahead of the United States in terms of the, the commitment of parents to, to spend whatever they have to get their child the best education. I mean, oh, I love the idea that in, in India where you, you know, where you look at the success of a, of a wonderful company like Baiju, who just spoke at our ASU GSV summit for the second or third time, where, where parents, where students are actually taking, basically taking curriculum twice, right? Because they, they, they take it in school and they go home and they take tuitions yeah. again at home. That does not, I, I wish that, you know, I would, I would give my right arm if that began to happen in the U.S. Same thing in China. Same thing really happens in China. We, we just feel China's too complex for us. We would need a much bigger team and, and different partnerships. So we we have great partners in China. Many of our LPs for, are from Chinatown and New Oriental, who are two, two of the, the, the two largest education companies in the world, are both LPs in our fund. But, but Asia is, uh, India and Southeast Asia are coming along very quickly. You know, Indonesia, fourth largest country in the world, right? Again, rising middle class, all kind. you know, they've historically had abysmal academic performance on like the PISA. They're always in the bottom, in the, in the very bottom. So we're just in the process of investing in a terrific company there that's maniacally focused on helping elevate teachers in te into teaching, pro providing higher quality instruction into K-12 after school with a real, with a real focus on how, how they could possibly help lift the academic outcomes of the of the entire of the entire country. So that'll be very that'll be very Indonesia focused. Most of our most of our companies are actually globally focused, but Indonesia is such a big market that that's terrific. So I just if you look at it, there are all kinds of great regulatory change. India you know began digitizing in 2004 2005. A lot of great companies have come out of that. The entrepreneurs in India are extraordinary. Changes coming in January in higher education related to, to, to the government's mm -hmm. ability, allowance of online degrees. So all kinds of really good things happening in India. You know, COVID's been fascinating because I'm actually on the board of Akash in India, which is the the medical and engineering test prep and 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 owner of Merit Nation in the K-12 market. Not actually through the fund, through another thing, but it's been inter it's been so fascinating to watch what co you know COVID you know forced India to. to to go to a virtual, you know, to an inside sales model, which as opposed to the door-to-door -door selling that was more regular. And I'm sure that will come back to some degree, but if it can stay, I mean, the inside sales model is so much more efficient and can allow some real, some real breakouts of companies, I think, post as we, when we go back to normal, it's pretty obvious that, you know, I wish we'd had a fund. I mean, all the, the, the leading, many of the leading Indian ed tech companies had came, came to the event that we put on at the ASU GSP summit years ago in the very early years. And unfortunately we didn't have a fund. I wish we had, and I wish we'd invested, but we didn't, we didn't have a fund, unfortunately, but, uh, but we, but we think it's there in the first innings. We think it will, you know, it will continue to transform the delivery of, of learning across the, the Indian continent. And so it's very exciting. You know, Jordan was interesting. It came, we, we were spending a lot of time in MENA generally. This is just a, this is just a fantastic team with very deep experience and, it, and backers who are, are, who are also deeply experienced in the, in the, thesis is while Jordan obviously is a very small market, the thesis really is the expansion across MENA of a, of, a, of a digital K-12 learning product. They've gotten a lot of support from the Jordanian government during COVID in wanting to spread, you know, their digital learning across the population, you know, but the hope is we'll move aggressively into Egypt and other countries with, you know, larger 
populations in demand. And we think and it is actually fun. The company's called Abwab and they, we had a competition, a global competition in our, as part of our ASU GSV summit this year it was the first time we'd actually done it. And we had a call for competitors and we had over 500 applications and we actually ended up with three finalists, including Abwab. And we did a live, we did a live bake off at our, ASU, at our summit event and virtual summit event. And they actually won, which was totally cool. So first time we've had Amina. Uh, competitor and, and winner. So it was, it was very, it was very exciting across the, the MENA region that, that a, a company had, ed tech company had uh, prevailed, which that was very cool. Great to see a Jordanian company in the ed tech space making headway. And definitely you're right. I think the Indian ecosystem has evolved over the last 10 years. And also I think India has become a self-consuming market. Earlier, it was, totally, totally. Uh, I think, the back end, tech back end of the world. Now it has just become the the market that everybody wants to go and build for India. Well, uh, I would also say, actually, what's interesting, what's been fascinating to me, not, I mean, a couple of things. One is just, you know, the, the, the bias towards engineering education. So yes. pretty much everyone is technologically competent. And, you know, which is not the case in, in many other countries, if any, if any. And so there, there's just anyone, you know, if I meet, you know, it, it is extraordinary, the engine of entrepreneurship that IIT, the, the various IITs are, it's, you know, I think I, I meet, you know, two or three people from my entrepreneurs from IIT almost every day. So that's amazing. But I'd also say what, what I, I think, and I think one of our important theses is that I think ed tech will be one of the biggest exports for India over the next five years. It's a, you know, incredibly high quality product being put out. It's an English speaking nation. So it's easy to port it out to other countries. Yeah. There are, you're already seeing it. I mean, Baiju will have very substantial revenues in the U S this year. And you're seeing a number of the higher ed players already competing out in, in outside of India in the U S and other, and other countries. So I think which I think is really interesting. So I, I think it makes it even more promising for the India ed tech market is that is that they have this very clear ability to export. You know, China really doesn't, right? Because it would require a complete retooling, not in the same yes. way. And, and China, by the way, doesn't need it. China's so big that, you know, it's you hardly need to move outside of your... And China has a... Has a high appetite for pay. I mean, they, there's no price pressure in the China market yeah. either. There, there is, there is price pressure in the Indian market, but, but yeah, no, it's fascinating it, and it's so fun. I mean, it's just fast. I mean, it's great to see the cultural differences and yeah. it's just very, it's, it's so cool. Anyway. If you look at the physical schools and the top 20 schools, the Ivy leagues and the whatnots, I think their 100-year experience or their legacy is built on the alumni that they have put forward, right? Maybe EdTech yeah, is too young to consider that, but do you see that there is a space for actually building a platform for the alumni of the EdTech graduates? Oh, for sure. I, yeah, for sure. I think that, I mean, we're already seeing it. I think we were already seeing I mean, I think the, yeah, I mean, I think IIT and the Ivy League and all those elite, you know, you know, uh, academic institutions are effectively recruiting machines, right? Because they, they do all the work, right? You know, they bring yeah. in the students of the highest promise and they um, spit them back out, but not, but they can't spit them out at, at enough scale to, you know, to make a difference in the workforce. And so for sure, I mean, Coursera is already seeing, and I think the, the other thing is just this breaking down of, you know, degrees into certificates and to, you know, I think we're, we're already, completely seeing Coursera's certificates on LinkedIn are the largest sort of yeah. number of certificates on LinkedIn. And I think their employers are totally, I think, breaking down. I mean, the employer attitudes about who they will hire, I think are changing very dramatically. It's, you know, it's really interesting. I mean, we, we you know, on the totally different end, we were an investor in a company called Guild Education, which is a very American company because it relies on American tuition benefit plans, which employers have, which are unique tax benefits um, for U.S. employers. So at least today and probably for the near term, Guild will be focused here. But but they've been a, a crazy successful company, one of the fastest, certainly the fastest scaling ed tech companies in, in the U.S. Yeah. ever. And what they're doing is they're taking the, pop, the frontline worker population who did not, maybe didn't finish high school, almost certainly didn't finish college. And, and even if they did finish college, they, they now need to be upskilled and reskilled because they, they're working in a distribution center and 
Amazon's going to, you know, take, going to replace them with robots. And so they need to be upskilled and employers increasingly realize that it, it is their responsibility to make sure their workers are re-equipped. So that's, and it's really exciting to watch companies get excited about the idea of retooling workforces and, and making sure that it, you know, whether it's to retain employees in different, you know, in different jobs or whether it's to, to train employees to, to actually seek work at, you know, other companies because there are no jobs left at, you know, at their company because they've automated them out. So I, I think, I think there's a lot of optimism around, you know, we all, we all focus on the, on the, I mean, the reality is only 30% of the U S has a college degree and in the world, it's something like, you know, I didn't get the number wrong. It's like 7%. I mean, it's like remarkably low, right? I mean, people, mm -hmm. I think in the U S People think, I think in their heads, they think like 70% of the population has a college degree. They don't. So, so we tend to focus on this sort of elite strata who don't move the you know, needle in terms of numbers. And I think the, some of the really exciting work is happening at both in, in for-profit and not-for-profit universities and online learning providers that, are, that may have a degree and may not, and maybe a credential of some sort. I think a lot of the, the most exciting work is happening against that group. Of, of much, you know, it's a much bigger chunk of the population and a much more critical group to, to reskill upskill. As we like to say, you know, it's, it's about all, pe you know, all people, ALL and capital letters, having equal access to the future. And that really means a future economy. And if we aren't providing that kind of educational and skilled support, we're going to lose, we're going to lose a lot of people and it's, and it's not going to be pretty for society. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's an exciting time that we find, you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs and, you know, as you well know, COVID perversely is as horrible and sad as it's been for so many people, you know, it has, it has created a profound change for the world of digital education. And really, you know, we believe accelerated the entire market by a couple of, by at least a couple of years in terms of just changing behavior patterns, changing people's sort of thinking about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable in terms of, of doing digital learning. So it's, it, it, it's a cause for optimism, I think. One of the listeners questions is actually based on COVID and he wanted to ask is what the roles of primary and secondary and tertiary education, do you think they will change as we come out of the lockdown and get to a quasi normal? Yeah, it's interesting, and I, and I don't want to be so parochial and U.S. focused, but and so as we think of we look we look at pre K to gray education, and so we think that I mean certainly it's going to be interesting, and certainly here here in the U.S. and around the world, K twelve parents have have now sort of seen in their living rooms, you know, the delivery of education, right, well or not, right, and some have been, and, and so I think at least in our market, in the U.S. market, we've seen just a blossoming of innovative ideas of, of entrepreneurs creating, you know, hybrid solutions, tech only solutions to, to, to deliver high quality education at low cost. I think we'll see more of that. There's going to be all kinds, I will see, there's going to be all kinds of uh, pressures like waves of, I think, retirement. I think teachers are going to be, you know, tired. Mm. We've already seen that here. We've actually, I mean, the, the, the saddest part is, you know, we have we've lost just a lot of children. I mean, here in Chicago, uh, our enrollment's down something like 12%. I mean, the, the kids have just disappeared, literally. And I, I think low-income kids are just not able to get online to do this virtual learning. And, and so there's going to need to be this recovery. And that will put a lot of pressure on the system, too. Higher ed was already moving, you know, online yeah. or at least hybrid. You know, the demand for, I mean, in the U.S., the demand for higher ed is declining because we're having, pop, you know, we have population declines like most, you know, developed countries. But in places like India and the rest of the world where, where populations are increasing, the demand for higher education is, you know, massive. And there was no way it was going to be supplied only by, phys, you know, the building of physical buildings because that just would, would not literally be possible. So I think... Hmm. So I think you already had a lot of innovation happening higher ed, and this has just accelerated it. So I think you're going to you're going to see, you'll see you know more high quality providers uh, providing dig digital education. There will always be a place um, for people to go physically to to, to school and to college to K twelve and to college if they, but but I think there will be a lot of pressure on mediocre providers of site-based education, particularly in higher ed. I think you're going to see, we're seeing it here like crazy, lots of schools going out of business. And 
and and you know, and the development of, of of online and hybrid offerings by physical schools too, if they want to, you know. So I think yes, I think we will have a lot of permanent change come out of COVID, and and also a real just focus on making digital learning better, you know, more outcomes driven, more results driven, more job driven, job linked, so that people really are bettering their lives by doing this. One of the other questions actually somebody had was, how does your team groom the startups or the investments that you make over a long period? Yeah, so we so we try to operate as like we call ourselves an ensemble. So we have entrepreneurs on our team, for, you know, entrepreneurs on our team. We have one of my partners, Julia Stieglitz, was a founding team member at Coursera, and she ran Google Apps for Education before that. Yeah, I you know I've just been in the ed tech ecosystem a very long time as a financial you know investment banker and and but but have been deeply into the you know the ed markets for a long time with mm. lots of relationships. So so we are very hands on. I mean we. We, we help companies hire people. We help companies create new business. I, this, this Indonesian company um, that we're investing in that we're so excited about was on the phone with this or on Zoom with this week. And, and they want, wanted their K-12 company, they want to understand how they can kind of deliver good assessment at scale. So I'm on the board of ETS, the um, testing service that does yep. the SAT and the TOEFL and everything else. So we had them on, a, I, I got to very senior sci- learning scientist or, or psychometrician at ETS. And we were just talking about what would make sense to put in place into their product to allow them to measure efficacy as they were delivering learning for kids and for kids in uh, Indonesia and actually to embed it with teachers. So, I mean, we do every time I help people, you know, recruit, we help people help recruit boards. We help people find, you know, next investors. I mean, we pretty much, whatever somebody wants, we do it. If they, you know, need advice on real estate, we'll find that it, it's, it's a really, you know, we're, we are sector because we're sector experts that, you know, we, we do, you know, we have expertise that's very complementary to a generalist fund that wouldn't, you know, probably spend a lot of time trying to, trying to know hundreds of superintendents and principals in, 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 in K-12 settings, or, you know, hundreds of university presidents and provosts in higher ed, or hundreds of, of learning leaders in the, in the workforce. And so we try to bring all that to bear. We are, we are, we are very hands-on and, and by the way, government tied. So, so we have Arnie Duncan, the former secretary of education, in the U S extraordinary human doing amazing work for low income people of color here in Chicago. Now Arnie's on our advisory board. You know, we talk to him all the time, you know, about, about, you know, how, how do we, how do we kind of get people to help, you know, when companies are trying to address, you know, tackle a big problem and because government, because obviously the education sector is, is emerging of a public sector and a private sector. And, and so we, you know, we have those contexts too. So, and we've got, a, and we've got a real global footprint. So we, and, and ed tech is so increasingly global. They're always going to be local government stuff, but, but in, in general, it's really become such a global you know, category that, it, you know, that that's, that's really fun too. I mean, that's really synergist. It, it creates great synergies too. And what are the, major differences that you see between the U.S. market and the Asian market now that you're exploring the Asian market? I think there's a much bigger propensity to spend, parents to spend in the Asian markets. Indonesia has to test that. They haven't done that yet. But I think, you know, Singapore, India, you know, develop, Vietnam, we're going to spend some time in um, now. They've got some developing businesses. So I think there's that. I think there is, there is you know, the aggression around learn, you know, discipline and aggression around learning is is definitely it is definitely of, of paramount importance i will say i think we're increasingly optimistic that there has been a, a change and at some point we'll figure out how to measure it in consumer spend or you know a change in attitude around consumer spend and education here in the u.s towards the positive which you think is great you know it, it, it is i think it's just we, we laugh terminology is different so there in, in india you have doubt solving companies in in the u.s that you know you, that translates into uh you know companies that help you students when they get stuck but they're basically saying the same they're saying the same thing yeah. which i i sort of love i sort of love that i love doubt solving as a concept as a term so i actually think it is and it's real you know hierarchies of teachers or i mean you know to how 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 but i think there is generally a move on the part of entrepreneurs to do things like elevate teachers, you know, give them, you know, give them other sources of support and faculty members, et cetera. So I think they're because I think, you know, price, certainly price is price sensitivity is very different because it, because GDP per capita is very different. 
you know, it's fascinating that, that Indonesia is substantially higher GDP per capita than India today still, which is interesting, which, you know, so it just, it just, and, and, and the U.S. is much higher, but, it, and yet we still don't spend, but, but it, it's, but that, but the GDP per capita is really important as you're thinking about kind of people, uh, people's ability to spend. And it's, and you have to think about how to, how to change your product in, in a local market to address that. But let, you know, obviously the language difference is the fact that in India, you, yeah. you know, you can have, you know, you can have um, so many different languages and, and you can really be advantaged if you actually serve people in all those different languages so that they can, you know, maybe at the end of the day, English is the, everybody would like to be able to speak English, but if you can get people there through, through, you know, the, all, the whole host of other languages, not just Hindi, it, it's really, it's, it's compelling. So it, less of that, obviously in a country like the U S but um, yeah, it's, 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 I love, you know, it's one of my favorite things about this job is that I get to, I get to get a flavor for both how similar we are and how, and how different we are. And, and I can't, I can't wait to travel again because I'm, I'm, I, I need, I need to plant myself in, in India and Southeast Asia for a couple of weeks. So anyway, looking forward Absolutely. to that moment. Uh, looking forward to having you in Asia. <laughs> Excited. I would like to get your views and the learnings that you have got from running the most successful, I think, EdTech Summit. You have hosted some amazing leaders. So what has been your major learning and who has been the most fascinating and impactful speaker ever? Oh my gosh, that is really hard. We have had so many good speakers. You know, the most I loved him, but I, you know, but our audience, we had President George Bush speak a couple of years, two years ago, I guess. And, and I think, you know, our, our audience was skeptical mm. that, that President Bush would say things and uh, that they, that they, that resonated for them. And, and, and I, that was one that I loved and he was delightful. He was funny. He was interviewed by uh, Carlos Watson, who runs Ozzy Media, who's a dear friend and partner of ours and, uh, and Carlos. It, it was great. He was, he, he was witty. He was funny. He was humble. What I loved. So I, it's not so much about whether I, you know, what I loved was just how, how, how surprised people were that they, mm. that they loved it and, and how gracious that people were in saying that they loved it when they had not expected to. So that, that you know, I, it restores your faith in humanity that people will, will, will sort of open their ears to listen to, to, a, to, a, to a person that they think they're diametrically opposed to and actually be willing to, to do that. I, oh, we'd say, we did the same thing this year with Charles Koch was a speaker on a virtual summit this year, was part of a, pan, a panel and, 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 I, and, he, and it was all virtual. So it wasn't live like President Bush was, but he, you know, he is an extraordinary intellect and he is doing incredible things in the U.S., supporting everything from prison reform to, to education reform. And anyway, again, I think he surprised a lot of people as I, as I, as I watched the reaction. So I, I kind of like that. Malcolm Gladwell this year was fantastic. Isabel Wilkerson wrote a book called Cast, where she actually looked at the caste system in India and, and issues in Germany and Germany, bringing it back to the, the issues of race here in the, in the U S it's, it's, I think one of the more brilliant books for, you know, of the year. And, and she was fantastic this year. So it's, it's hard to pick who's great, my, who's the best, but my partner, Michael Moe always does a really fabulous opening keynote, which, which he did again this year, but to kind of at least frame the issues that we're trying to think about and in, in, in the, the potential impact of education technology. But, but yeah, no, the event is, it, it's, it's a pre, it's a great opportunity. We're pretty proud of the coolest thing about being virtual this year, because obviously people would rather have been live in San Diego, having fun and having dinners and you know, whatever, hugging and shaking hands, which one day again, one day we'll do again. But what was cool in having to do it virtually, so we'll always have a hybrid from now on, is we you know, we actually served, you know, over 50, 15,000 people attended, which was great. It was over five days. And we actually have a follow-up coming next week, next Friday with, with David, with General David Petraeus and his daughter-in-law, who was also in the military. And, but we, we actually had, we had at least one representative from every, from 70% of all countries in the world actually attended. So we had Bhutan, we had Iceland, we had, I mean, it, I mean, the list was really quite amazing, which of course we would never be able to do on, on the ground. So it was, and it also, I think speaks to how energized people are around the potential for education innovation in the world. So yeah, it was, I hope we, I hope we can be back live in a hybrid event in July, but it's more optimistic today. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. 
Now we're going to get into a rapid fire three questions, one word or one sentence. Are you ready? I am. The hardest thing about your job? Telling companies we don't want to invest. One book or a blog that has influenced you the most? Oh, I just have to think about, I have to think about this year. Well, cast this year has, has absolutely influenced me the most. One person who has influenced you the most? My dad. Thank you, Deborah. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was thank you. It was an honor.